All right, you guys, we have a, a very special guest uh, tonight. Uh, we're, we're really excited to have this conversation with Mark Schulman. He has enjoyed unprecedented, uh, a cr- unprecedented career over the last 30 years as a first call drummer for world-class rock and pop artists. He's done four record-breaking world tours as the drummer for Pink. Oh, may have heard of her. Right. She, I think I think she might be somebody someday. Yeah, I think she's, she's going somewhere. Her way up. Yeah. She's going somewhere. And uh, has also worked with a who's who of international rock and roll royalty, including acts such as Cher, Billy Idol, Foreigner, Cheryl Crow, Stevie Nicks, and Beyonce. Mark is a classically trained cellist, author. That's I don't, I don't know if he's talent. a classically trained author, but he's a classically <laughs> trained cellist and an author awesome. and a corporate speaker. And probably the coolest of all, a cancer survivor. He's performed for over a billion people in his career. What have you been doing with your life, Kevin? (laughs) (laughs) And he is with us tonight to share his secrets to developing a rock star attitude. Mark, thank you so much for being with us tonight. How are you? Uh, Can I have that applause button with me at all times? (laughs) You guys were magnificent. What, What an intro. Like Normally, the people are so serious about the intro. And you guys, you know, you're just a bunch of kids. Right. What are you, right. That's what it's all about tonight, being a bunch of kids. That's right. <laughs> well, you you told me uh, when you were watching some of the videos that Mark had. Yes. And uh, Pink gave him a little bit of a nickname, right? Well, there was that, the promo video on your site where she called you Disneyland because you're like the yes. happiest person she knows. Is that like a thing between you two? No, I just feel very honored that an artist of such... Um, um, just amazing talent and status would would bestow upon me the nickname of Disneyland. But that's because I am a gratitude evangelist and it's contagious. (laughs) And that's what she bases it on because I have constantly talked about the power of gratitude. I talk about the power of gratitude. It's one of my big focal points when I when I speak um, and how you can use gratitude to be an immediate attitude shift. So we can even talk about that. If there's anything that well, anybody wants. Where to talk did about. that come from? Were you always someone who had that mindset, or did some did, did that kind of come with? You time? know, I have generally been a half as uh, a, the glass is half full type of guy, but I've made a lot of conscious decisions, and you know, I'll just get right into it. So fundamentally, what I talk about, what I what I live, eat, and breathe. And while I'm writing my next book about co-writing my next book with this great man, Dr. Jim Samuels, that actually sort of created these concepts, is based on the power of attitude. It's based on a formula. And essentially, as we know, after all we've been through with this pandemic, we cannot control what happens to us so much of the time. But you always have the power to change, control, or shift your attitude about what is happening to you. And all that is is simply a decision that you make to choose an attitude that serves you. And why would you do that? Because it gives you leverage. And don't underestimate the power of a decision because when you truly make a decision, you're cutting off all other possibilities. And your attitude is your viewpoint. It is your reality. It is what you see. It's your vantage point or your disadvantage point, depending upon the attitude that you choose. Because what we look at, um, excuse me, what we look at and what we see, it's not what we look at, it's what we see and perceive that matters. The way we perceive ourselves, the lens through which we see the world, the meaning that we attach to people, places, and circumstances are all based on the stories that we tell ourselves. And these stories are based on the attitudes that we have the power to choose. And who's telling the story? You're telling the story. You're the narrator. You can change the narrative. So there's so much power in understanding that at any moment in time, you actually do have the power to shift your attitude. And it's a conscious decision. And then your attitude is what drives your behavior. Think about the power of that. That's huge. Your attitude can drive your behavior. And then your behavior is what determines the consequences of your life, the outcomes of your life. So by shifting your attitude, you are literally changing the outcomes of your life. 
That's huge. It's so simple. It's so powerful. It's A times B equals C. It's that simple. And that's what I live by. And that's why I'm such an, an evangelist. And gratitude is one of the immediate attitude shifts. Because if you're feeling funky, and I don't mean funky, not like, like you want to dance, but feeling funky, like emotionally compromised, and you just stop in that moment and give yourself the luxury of using gratitude, being grateful for a person or something, and just sit with it and then do it again and then do it again, and then do it again. It's like you're building up a fortress of gratitude that literally surrounds, fills, and protects you. And I get on stage every single night, and when I have my little break, when I'm playing with Pink, and then they're showing a little film, I always think of one person for which I'm grateful. Mm. And then the endorphins literally, go, like I can feel the endorphins in my brain and the shift in my body, and it literally empowers me. So that's an example of one of my immediate attitude shifts. So that's where our Disneyland was a long winded answer to where Disneyland came from, because I would always talk about gratitude. And it's so contagious that, you know, that became a thing. Well, it's definitely something that's a message that we can get behind and, and talk a lot about. I, it's unfortunate you didn't have anyone to share that with this last year, because no one needs that message <laughs> in a time where we feel like we oh, have right. no control, right? But that's that's the whole point is we have, so much more control than we than we realize such a, for such a time as this for your message and the power of that to change people's reality right yeah, for sure so it, let me it, ask, I mean, go ahead. reality is is based on your perception mm -hmm. and your perception is based on the attitudes that you choose it's that simple so you really can alter your reality the way you perceive the world by shifting your attitude for sure yeah. uh I, I want to know, how did you get into the music business? Like, how did that, uh, especially, he's a cellist, how do you go so, from a yeah. classically trained cellist right. to drummer for Pink and Stevie Nicks? All right, well, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit, right? I'm old enough that I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when I was like two. And I saw John and Paul and George. And then I saw Ringo. I'm like, oh, my God, something resonated. Like, I got the bug. I saw you, his big, beautiful nose and, and on all screaming girls. I'm like, I want that. Like, I knew uh, drums chose me. And then my mom's like, you know, mom, I want to play drums. No, drums are too loud. Can't you play a nice instrument like your brother, Randy? He plays violin. So I'm at my brother's violin lesson. And there's a big violin in the corner. I go, I want to play that. Well, that was cello. So my godfather, who was our teacher, would give me a little drum lesson at the end of every cello lesson. But I was never a great cellist. I really wanted to play drums. And finally, at nine years old, my parents could not deny my passion any longer. And they bought me my first drum set. And that was it. Couldn't stop me. But I kept on playing cello. And I even played cello on the Pink Tour, on the Funhouse Tour, when she did one of, a, one of her ballads um, that I didn't play drums on. I mean, I was playing easy cello parts because I would never call myself a cellist. I, would, I don't dishonor cellists anymore that way because cello is something you need to practice. I play drums. I don't even play percussion. I play drums. That's what I do. But drums literally chose me. I sat at a drum set at five years old. I could play. I knew what to do. I wasn't a prodigy per se, but I knew what to do. So it was just up to me to, and my, my, the support of my incredible erudite um, pro professorial parents that were both professors that bought me a drum set and let me have the drums in the room next to theirs. I mean, I give them so much credit. They were incredible people. Then they let my band rehearse and I just grew up playing music. I didn't even get a bachelor's degree. I quit college to play music full time. And then I ended up like now I do executive summits for CEOs. Um, that's why when I got my CSP, which is that certification you get at NSA, it was a big deal to me because my dad had a Met, my, had a PhD, my mom had a master's, and I didn't even have a bachelor's degree. And I was supposed to have a high IQ. And so when I got the certification for being a speaker, I was like, I was literally in tears. I'm like, I'm getting certified. I've arrived. If only my parents were alive to see this. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, yeah, kudos. We mentioned last week when we, when we uh, were uh, letting people know you were going to be on that that you had achieved that, and that is that's uh, it's no small no small feat. feat. Yeah. So uh, definitely, uh, 
I, but I do have to say kudos to your parents because, you know, if our nine year old oh, right yeah. now, we have a nine year old son, and if he really was asking his drums, it'd be a hard yes. It would be a yeah. hard to enter, you know, no offense against the drums. It's more of just like the vibe of the house the having that constant percussion well, that you're not in control of would be very challenging. So good for them because it's we had a drum happens. set in our house. It was my daughter's 11. So at two years old, she had her own drum set. She didn't care. She just didn't. Drums isn't her thing. She dances. She does martial arts. She writes. She sings. She does all this other stuff. But the drums would just sit there. And I would sit down to play. I'd play one beat. My wife would be like, no, go to the recording studio. Because I got my own studio where I have a gazillion drums. So, uh, no, the drums, I, I ended up donating the drums to a charity. <laughs> I could never play them at all. Wasn't fair to the, the family. <laughs> Well, I love that you you see the Beatles and it's Ringo you're you you hone in on. Like to me, it's like everyone's focused right? on John and Paul, and you're like, no, I want to be that guy, that guy, that. Guy. Well, this was it. it should, but but it, it was sort of a predestination. I do believe that we are born with our interests. You know, you're an artist. You must have gravitated toward that your entire life. Am I right? I mean, yep, some yep. people discover their interests later on, but I was fortunate enough that the interest literally like chose me, um, and. All I needed to do was practice, <laughs> which I did a lot, and play in a lot of bands. And I did that too. Yeah. And Go ahead, Kim. I was going to say, so so you're drumming all the time. You have probably bands in high school. It kind of sounded like, how did that transition into a full-out career? Because you kind of hear a lot of, we have friends who have been in bands, and you know, and they kind of eventually fizzle out, and then people, you know, kind of move on, but like, how does that, what does that transition, what did that look like for you? I was very myopic. That's all I wanted to do. That and sort of, I really liked like engineering and recording my band. So I, I became sort of a natural um, foray into me being a band leader. So I, I, I used to lead my original bands and record and produce my bands. Um, and then I had the chance to audition um, for a super group called Bad English, which was the guys from Journey and John Waite. And I just horribly messed that audition up. And that was a very pivotal moment in my life because I thought I was going to, I thought it was going to change my life that day because I was going to get the gig. Instead, I sped up horribly. I got horribly nervous. And I remember going to my car and just crying, literally, and just hitting the steering wheel going, accountant, doctor, attorney. Why did I take my Jewish parents' advice and do that instead? But that was a, 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 a transitional moment because that's the moment that I really made the decision that I was going to, um, I was either going to get off the stage for good <laughs> or I was either going to improve my internal meter because I realized since I was rushing under pressure, my meter wasn't under control and your internal tempo, your internal meter is foundational for all musicians. And then I also made a promise to myself that um, I was going to trans transition my fear into confidence. Mm -hmm. And I got very philosophical. I was studying with Dr. Jim, the guy that's now writing my book with me. I read so many books and I just did a lot of inner work. I stopped partying. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. And I just got really serious about perfecting my craft. And then I got my first road gig when I was 26, playing with Brenda Russell, this R&B artist, and it just snowballed from there. And I've been on the road ever since. I've been with Pink for 15 years. And the speaking came out of the fact that I have two parents that were teachers. And my mom, I was actually, because my dad was a grammar and composition master, he wrote four college level, level grammar books. I actually could teach grammar very well. My mother gave me my own class to teach when I was 19 illegally because she ran a tutorial center. So I taught this class, this grammar class, and then I kind of got the bug. And then I did about a thousand drum clinics in my life. I used to do drum clinics and music clinics for, and then at a point I realized, wait a minute, I could take this sort of protocol and I, I could apply it to the college market and the corporate market because people were resonating more with the success coaching and the stories than they were just the playing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And then I started very small with a few corporate gigs and some college gigs. And I just built that up and I perfected my craft. I studied with two speaking coaches, an acting coach, a director, a storyteller. 
and I really honed in on how to do what I do for the corporate audience. And now I have, you know, some of the biggest corporate speaking clients on the planet. And, and I still play with pink. It's like, pinch me, you know, I'm like the luckiest guy on the planet. I got a beautiful wife and 11 year old daughter. And, and, and I'm so grateful, but I've worked my ass off. That's true. Every day, even today, I was sitting there calling meeting planners, you know, like I don't, I love to work because, um, I, I see the, 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 the fruits of my, of my labor. And I also know that what I do, I believe has meaning. And you got a little taste of what I talk about in my speech and that level of energy. And I'm able to give that to the people in the corporate market, especially now during COVID. And I do it virtually here or I do it live. And I just believe that I can do something that really matters. And it's a natural evolution for me. So because I've been playing drums on the road with all these great artists for so many years, but speaking is like a natural evolution, as you guys know, because you transition from what you were doing into creating this amazing speaking program. By the way, you guys, if you've never seen them speak, they spoke at the National Speakers Association when I got my CSP and they were the hits of the entire show. No, Everybody no, no, loved no. what they did. They were just so progressive and communicated so well in your stories and your timing and the and your and your um, the way that you you're, you're so you know the way that you synchronize and I'm I'm lost for words as a guy that was doing <laughs> grammar and composition. I'm a little lost for words tonight. I don't know, what can I say? Well, thank you. Well, we, thank uh, you. We, we were talking before we, 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 we pushed record pushed about. Record about the, the, uh, doing a little uh, drawing lesson that I got, got to do, and, uh, and I'm gonna need a drum lesson. Need a drum so lesson. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll. I, I owe you one. I owe you one. I know it's grammatically incorrect. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for pointing that out. I always tell people I can make grammar mistakes, mistakes because I know what I is know correct. What they are. Right. 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 Uh, well, by the way, back to your thought about we were talking, you were talking about your parents and their higher level education. I, I was thinking about the fact that earning a CSP is like almost getting a PhD in speaking mm -hmm. and the speaking profession. So, it, you know, it, it, you know, they have those kind of honorary degrees. That's kind of what a CSP is. So that's kind of a yeah, cool. And there's it's no joke. You got to put in the work. You got to be legit. You can't just fake your way through it. Right. So, so it's kind of neat to, to see that connecting point. Well, thank you. I mean, doing the administration for it alone, you should get your CSP because it took like four, 40 hours to amass 10 years of speaking right. um, paperwork and proof and check stubs and contracts and because you really need to show that you the accomplishments yeah it's accomplishment based they don't test you it's just based on what you've actually done yeah so uh that takes a long time to amass <laughs> for sure. yeah well uh kara here uh, is on she actually uh used to work for nsa and so she knows it's a huge accomplishment awesome kara. yeah kara knows yeah. Um, I, well, I'm glad you brought up. I'm, I'm glad you brought up about getting into the speaking business because it's unusual. It's it's like same thing as me. Like you don't usually see artists who are willing to get up and in, in front of people and give a talk, and you don't see a lot of uh, musicians who are out giving speeches. As much as they're on stage, it's a it's a different art form and it's a different craft. So I'm glad you. You talk yeah, about you that. Need to be about that. You, you need to get bitten by the bug and feel like you have something of value because there are so many musicians, even record label people that contact me and say, I want to get into speaking. I said, well, just be prepared. It's an enormous amount of work. I said, I will talk you through it. I will coach you through the entire thing. I'm willing to do that. Um, but it really is something that I've built up over time as you have built up over time. And you really learn how to communicate in a way you want your, to make sure that your audience gets it. When you're playing music as a musician, it's one type of communication to get up and actually speak and hold the attention of 20 to 10,000 people when it's only you. It's I, I call it a one man show. That's why I call my show a rock show disguised as a keynote because I play drums and I bring people up on stage and we do interactive clapping and interact. Uh, sometimes they have drumsticks and we do inter interactive exercises with the drumsticks and it's really fun. And, and I want it to be an experience that's, you know, kinetic, not just a talking head.
Yeah. And uh, that's what I believe I have to offer that's unique. I mean, there are some amazing musicians that speak. Mike Rayburn is mm -hmm. a great example. I mean, I, there, there are a lot of people. And it's funny that the speakers are the new rock stars to me. Like, I look up to the great speakers like they are rock stars because to me, it's like, wow, you've been doing this for 20 years and you've done how many speeches? And, well, you know, it's, 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 it's real fun. That's fun. So tell me a little bit about this, the rock star attitude. I know that's something that you talk a lot about. What, what is that? What does that mean? And, and, and how do you, how is that applicable? How do you get a rock star attitude, especially if you can't drum? Well, I, I, I pretty much gave it away already because to me, um, the rock star attitude means that you are willing to make the commitment to creating attitude shifts. Mm -hmm. And because to me, the rock star is the top performer. You know, the, the term rock star means you are a great performer, period, in anything that you do. And that takes a level of commitment. It takes a willingness to shift your attitude to drive these behaviors and these consequences that you know are possible. And that to me, very simply, is the rock star attitude. It's not about music. It's about being a rock star in anything you do and embracing that viewpoint, whether you're like, you know, a waiter um, or a server, you know, you can do that with an incredibly wonderful attitude. Like even last time we, we went out to dinner the other night and this gal was just amazing. She couldn't have been more than like 21 years old. And my wife's like, wow, she's so, such an amazing server. And she just made us feel good and just was so attentive and so appreciative. And it's like, that's the rock star attitude. Rock star attitude means you are shining in everything you do. It means that you are unwilling to deny yourself and the people with whom you're communicating anything but the best of what you got and the best you can give. And certainly we don't, we're not always in that mood, <clears throat> but that's the importance of the attitude shift of knowing. As a matter of, I'm going to take you through a quick attitude shift right now. Everybody can do this right now. I'll show you what I do every single day in my life. This is how I create the attitudes. Okay. The idea is I want to think of an attitude, that I want to foster, that I want to create. You can call it an attitude, you can call it a mindset, you can call it a viewpoint, whatever you want to call it. Um, essentially, uh, would be an example like happiness or love or confidence or joy. Let's take joy as an example. That's a very, very easy one. So what I want to do is I want to combine the best psychology and physiology that I have learned to be able to produce the most immediate and powerful results to create an immediate attitude shift. So the idea is I want to first prep my brain that something cool is about to happen. And the easiest way of doing that is simply counting backwards from five like it's a rocket launch. So I'm going to do it right now. So I go five, four, three, two, one. I shut my eyes. I clench my fist as tight as I can. I tighten my core and I recall a time when I was joyful. And then I hold it. I let it go. I was just thinking about the other night we were walking our dog and my daughter is so into her mythology books that she was telling me about it. She was having so much fun. She wanted to go around the block again. And she gave me this big hug and kiss and I could smell her hair and I could, you know, feel the muscles in her body. She's a brown belt, which the next is black belt. She's 11 years old, right? So I had just created an immediate attitude shift. So everybody stand up right now. Let's do this. I want you all stand up. We're going to do this together. I'm going to take you through the attitude shift. Okay, I'm bending over a little bit so I can see, see myself. Okay, so I want you to think of a time when you were joyful. Think of a time with your with your with your significant other, your lover, your friend, your kids. When you were listening to music, when you were at a concert, any time when you were joyful. Okay, think of it. Okay, I'm going to prep your brain. Are you ready? I'm going to count backwards. Five, four, three, two, one. Shut your eyes. Clench your fists as tight as you can. Tighten your core as tight as you can. And recall a time you were joyful and hold it and involve all your senses as much as you can. Let it go. Okay, now we're going to do it again. I want you to count backwards with me. Are you ready? I want you to think of one more time when you were joyful. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, 
One, close your eyes, clench your fist, tighten your core as much as you can and think of a time when you were joyful and hold it. Ah, let it go. Okay, so what happens is I do this four times in a row until I have this big old shift eaten grin on my face. <laughs> And that's when I know that I've shifted my attitude because as science would tell us, when you smile, you're activating hundreds of muscles in your face and that sends a signal to your body to relax and sends endorphins to your brain. And that one attitude shift will last me hours. It might last me the day or I might need to do it 20 times a day because I'm having a challenging day or I might keep on repeating it because I'm at such a good place with my attitude that I just want to keep on reinforcing it. So that is a way right then and there. And I do this every single day and it works for me. I swear to God, it works for me. I know it can work for you. I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love so it. simple. I love you know, people want to make this stuff very thing. complicated. Yeah. As yeah. simple. That's why we, we call our, our formula ABC, attitude times behavior equals consequence. We want it to be as easy as it, as it possibly can be. And the first thing I do in the morning, by the way, my morning routine, the first thing I do is I get up and I go 24 brand new hours and I smile. And I just sit there in my bed like a crazy person and smile. And I could just feel the physiology changing. It literally shifts it for you. It's that such is, an amazing, simple thing. I'm sure thing. you know, Mark, I'm sure you know Willie Jolly, uh, acclaimed speaker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Josh, He's literally speaker. jolly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, we had him on a couple weeks ago for the same, you know, live show. And he said the exact same thing. Do you remember that? He yeah. said that's what he does. He wakes up in the morning and he just says, I, I woke up. I have this day. This, You know, that same mindset, yeah. that shift, that's so yeah. intentional. And um, I can't help but think that that's a common bond between this joy that both of you share. Absolutely. And you know, that word intentional is so strong because you are applying intention and attention. When you apply attention and intention to anything, it's amazing what we can create. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here to do, especially after we've been through all this wild stuff. Right. It's really working on creating the attitude shifts that we want to, that we choose to create. Yeah, I I can't say enough how how important it is for people to realize just how much control they have over things. It's like again, this last year it's easy to look at all the things that are out of your control and be anxious about it, but um, everything you're saying is within everyone's reach. And I think I, I was going to ask, like, what, what do you think is the biggest barrier to people having that rock star attitude? Is it, to me, it feels like it's probably just believing it's possible. Would you say that? Or is there something else? I was just going to say the barrier is believing you can't, mm -hmm. you know, and what was it that was it Thomas Edison or Henry Ford that said, if you think you can do it or you think you can't do it, you're right. Yep. Because if you believe you can't do it, you're not going to do it because you're focusing on the double negative goal. It's like saying that uh, if when I if I say this right now, don't think of a white elephant. <laughs> what do you, do? you can't <laughs> help but think of a white elephant. <laughs> right. Because the negative focus is still a focus. So if you simply change your focus to a single positive, instead of thinking about what you can't do or thinking about what isn't going to work, you shift it to what is going to work. And it really, it's again, it's just your mind, you're senior to your mind. Your mind doesn't control you. You can control your mind. There's something powering the mind. There's, they call it spirit, whatever you want to call it. You know, the, the what, soul, I, you know, I'm not going to get too metaphysical on anybody here, but we have the power to control our minds. And once you set your mind in motion, that's why when I did that attitude shift, I was setting up my mind to expect something and the physiology helps support the psychology because rather than just recalling a time when I was joyful, I'm physically putting my entire body into it. So I'm creating like what Tony Robbins would call a state change. Mm -hmm. You're changing your state, your physical state. And that's what it's all about. If you combine psychology with physiology, it's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And just know that you can. Yeah. Know that you can. You have the power. You are telling the story. You're the narrative. You, you're the narrator. You can change the narrative. It's well, simple. 
I love it. I love that. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Willie Jolly or Willie Jolly earlier, and this was a question we had asked him, and I want to get your uh, input on this or your your take on is this. Is this the like out of left field kind yes, of question? Yes. Okay, so get ready because this is off subject to everything we've talked about. Hey, I'm looking at take a left field right the now. Willie Jolly was a segue that has no relevance to anything other than that. That's as close as I could get it to be out of left field. Yeah. So what we talk, I mean, obviously we were, we're, we're very, we have a lot of fun. We talk about being more childlike, bring that childlike spirit. What is a food sound or smell that most reminds you of childhood? Ooh, a, a nice bean and cheese burrito. Really? Mm. What's the story there? Because it reminds me of when we were a kid, every Friday night we used to go out to dinner with our friends. And most of the time we go to this Mexican restaurant called Santana's and I get the bean and cheese burrito and I loved it. <laughs> I love okay, it. now I want Mexican. <laughs> and the sound of my childhood is every Beatles record ever oh. and every Monkeys record ever. Monkeys. Because, you know, that's what I listened to when I was a kid. My brother's six years older than me, so he got me into like Frank Zappa. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but, you know, Whenever I listen to the Beatles, it always has like a childhood, you know, uh, association for me. Yeah. So I. What was who, the other one? So you said taste. Oh, just eat any of them, any of them. So you you said taste. So, so if I could, so if I could listen to a Beatles record and eat a bean and cheese burrito, <laughs> okay. childhood rocks. <laughs> I'm pretty childlike and sometimes a little childish. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I love having an 11 year old because she's like. She just looks at me like, you're such a dork. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know you're doing it right. I'm yeah. like a big kid. I'm a big kid for God's sakes, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, That's talking about uh, musicians, obviously we, we've talked about how you, you've uh, worked with Pink for, for 15 years, I think you said. Um, yeah. And obviously she's at the top, top of her game. What, what is something, what is a lesson that you have learned from her? Oh, my God. So many. I mean, in 2010, I'll be very, very brief. We were in Berlin, Germany, and we were, and we would always end the set with the song "So What," and she would do this what we call the 360, where she'd come running out from behind the stage wearing this harness, and she'd jog down the ramp to the front of the stage, where she'd be greeted by two dancers who would clip her in with two carabiner clips and attach to each carabiner clip or two eye tension cables that would stretch across the entire audience. When she'd give the signal to the computer operator, he would lift her up and he'd lift her and she goes soaring across the audience. She'd go speeds of like 30 miles an hour, drops of up to 25 feet. She'd even cruise around to the people in the back of the audience so the people in the cheap seats could see the sweat on her brow. And then one night we were in Berlin, Germany, 50,000 people was one of the craziest audiences ever and she was they were just on fire she was on fire she ran down the ramp full speed they immediately clipped her in and she immediately lifted her arm what she didn't realize is one of the carabiner clips was turned upside down and the dancer was trying to clip it in and she wasn't clipping and she, she didn't know it and by the time she realized it and the computer dude realized it in the two seconds I'm talking two seconds that it took, instead of getting lifted up above the audience, she got brutally and rapidly dragged across a satellite stage, across hot lighting cans. She got yanked six feet off the side of the stage into what we call the pit, then pulled all the way up against the metal side railing. And that's how quickly it happened. And I, I couldn't even breathe. And then the audience was dead silent, the band was dead silent, she was dead silent. I literally thought she was dead. And I heard the sweetest sound. It's the sound of Pink cussing. She was cussing. She was alive. She was breathing. She was angry. This was an amazing sign. But what happened next was totally unprecedented. Because in addition to all the techs jumping into the pit, her husband, Carrie, ran down, jumped into the pit to help her. Well, he helped her all right. He helped her crawl back onto the stage. The poor girl was battered, Bruce. I thought she was dead. She's crawling back onto the stage. And then she's trying to stand up, the poor thing. She can't even stand up. He hops on the stage to help her stand up. She stands up, it looks like she's broken her leg. Her leg is dangling. She's leaning on his shoulder. And then she says to the audience, listen, everybody, I'm too injured to perform the last song, but I feel so bad. I want to give everybody their money back with one song left. And at that point, they brought a stretcher onto the stage. They hauled her off on the stretcher and the audience raged even louder than before. And I looked at the audience and half the people had tears in their eyes. 
It brought tears to my eyes. I kid you not. It was, I think we had this emotional realization together that we thought we lost Pink. But that was also the, the moment that I realized, wow, we know we cannot control what happens to us. And talk about an example of being a real rock star. She climbed back onto the stage. In other words, she, you know, I talk about it as the greatest customer service on the planet. She put the well-being of her audience, of the band, the dancers, the singers, the crew before her own well-being. And then she crawled onto the stage where she couldn't stand and she immediately apologized when it wasn't her fault. She took full responsibility, full culpability. And not one of the 225 people on the road got um, lost their job or even got in trouble because she took responsibility for the entire thing. And that's what a rock star leader does. That's what a rock star performer does. They take care of their own. And I was so blown out. Everybody was so completely blown out. And then the next day we had a day off. Homegirl's built like a truck. She didn't break any bones or barely broke any skin. And there was rumor from management that we would just discontinue doing it because it was too darn high risk and the insurance premiums probably shot up. The next day, she didn't want to know anything about canceling. She got up during sound check, did the red check herself. That night, we were not only performing So What, she was back up doing the 360 two days after she nearly died. I mean, the PTSD alone right. would have kept the average person from doing that. Mm. So what did I learn from Pink? She's a freaking badass. <laughs> she will not stop at anything for her level of commitment to the audience, for her level of commitment to us, including nearly dying and not even stopping. Wow. So I feel like a mere mortal when I work with her. I'm on the stage looking at her literally doing death defying stunts every night, and she just challenges herself to no end. But that's. If you want to be world class, the world, I heard this from another speaker and I use it in my speech. The world class begins where our comfort zones end. Mm -hmm. you want to be world class? You got to get outside of that comfort zone. You and somebody said, I've seen the video that is scary. You yeah, can't even I'm imagine how crazy. I felt with that Christy being on the stage and not knowing. I literally, I just thought she was dead. I was, I was in, I was pan, I was like having a panic attack. Yeah. I can't, I can't imagine. imagine. And her husband's going to run. Pissed off. Her. Then she's like, fuck, shit. And then she's like cussing, excuse my <laughs> friend. You know? Sounds ever. And you're like, I'm like going, what? You're alive. And then you're, dra you're having your husband drag you back to the stage. It's like, that's pink. Wow. Well, it's got to be so neat to work with someone that you admire and that you trust in a way that no matter what happens, because I'm sure there's just a lot of crazy stuff that happens from one show to the next, um, that you're, it, you have that leadership that is going to give you the confidence to just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. So that's got to be such a neat feeling. Um, well, she raises the bar. It's like another thing I talk about in my presentation is I made a decision that every single note that I play matters. Mm -hmm. Every nuance matters. And it finally occurred to me that if I view it that way, then I'm attaching a sense of purpose to every note. Because people talk about passion, but passion is fleeting. Passion may be how we do it, purpose is why we do it. So the moment I attach a sense of purpose to every note, I become more passionate about the note. The passion feeds the purpose, the purpose feeds the passion. And that's how I've been able to play So What by Pink over 800 times because I know why I'm doing it. Hmm. And I'm doing it because every single note matters because she is busting her ass. And so when you have somebody like that who's your leader, every single person on that tour busts their ass hmm. for her and for the tour and for the audience and for each other. Hmm. That's the like rock to. Reminds me a little bit of uh, that Netflix. Well, I guess it was ESPN did that with the Last Dance with Michael Jordan and um, the Bulls. And there was a thing at the very end where Jordan said, like, you know, people would say how hard he was, 
on people. And he said, I've never asked anyone to do anything that I haven't done myself. And it reminds right. me of that, that um, to just that by example makes a big difference. So well, he was he was cut from his high school basketball team. Yeah. I mean, he was known for just outworking everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like if you're willing to do the work, you will reap the benefits. Yeah. And some people have it naturally, other people don't. Yeah. And it's not even how naturally you have it, it's how hard are you willing to work. Yeah. And, well, and I also look at it like it's not necessarily work. Like I don't work music, I play music. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm getting on, getting about to make a call to somebody, one of my attitude shifts is I don't have to, I get to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a big one for me. Like I get to call this person and I get to connect with somebody or I get to do this, or I even get to take out the trash because I'm lucky enough to own this house. You know, there's always a way that you can reframe things in your head to, again, shift your attitude and your perception and see it differently. Yeah. yeah. Boy, you have given us a treasure trove of new ways to perceive all the challenges that we have right now. And I know our comments have been blowing up. I, I know we've been busy talking, but people are very appreciative. Our deltitis fighters are just saying that this has been amazing. So thank you, oh, Mark. And you know, you can if you go to mark markshulman.com, it's right up there. Um, there's a lot of information and I, I, I give, I do a lot of little mini speeches with a lot of different concepts and you could sign up for my newsletter. Sweet. Um, I'm actually going to release a newsletter. I was going to release it today. I'm not at the time yet. I might do it tonight because I have another speech that I've done that I need to edit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I like to be of service. Um, so, you know, feel free. You can even contact, you can get to me through my website. So if you really want to get to me, you can find me. <sighs> That's awesome. Well, Mark, this has been a treat. I have a million other questions I'd love to be able to ask, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate the time you've given us, and I'm glad that our paths crossed and that you were willing to come on and uh, share all this great stuff. So. And sharing time is always the greatest gift, so please thank your wife and your sweet daughter for giving a part of their evening that would have been with you, with us. We appreciate that. Uh, so. My pleasure. I'm going to pick up the badass from martial arts in a minute anyway. <laughs> Keep her um, happy, man. Yeah, you can uh, get you know, I, I'm so grateful for having been here because I know that you guys are the real deal and you really blew me out. And I know that you have this, you deserve this amazing following of people and they deserve you. You know, it's, it's such a wonderful, it's so wonderful to be able to be in the position that you're in and be able to bring people like me in and just and give people all the information that you have yourselves. Um, I'm just grateful for the whole damn thing. Aww. Same, same here. Well, thank you, thank Mark. Keep rocking, Mark, and stay safe, and we'll connect you guys soon. Keep rocking, too. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to answer more questions. I know there was so much going on, but it was so much information. So uh, you can find me through the website and ask me questions. Sounds good. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Have a good Appreciate night, Mark. It. All right, you guys. Take care. Bye.